Welcome to another episode of the Sustainable Innovation Series. I'm your host, Luc, and today I will be speaking to Hugh Mason. Hugh is an absolute veteran in the area of entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, he's been active as an entrepreneur and investor for over 30 years. Uh, in fact, he set up one of the first incubators or accelerators in Singapore and Southeast Asia uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, can you just take us through your career trajectory a little bit? How did you start? How did you get on the path of entrepreneurship? Uh, just take us through uh, the last uh, what is it, 20, 30 years journey. Sure, well I'm, I'm 55 now and I think one of the nice things about being my age, you know, there are a few disadvantages, but there are some advantages um, like having a sense of where your life has come from and gone to. And as I look back now, innovation has been a key part of it. Um, I thought I was going to be an engineer when I was 18 when mm -hmm. I left school. Um, I joined an engineering company and worked hands-on in a research environment. Um, but then joined the BBC when I graduated and, and made films about science and technology. Um, like most entrepreneurs, my journey into entrepreneurship was an accident. Mm -hmm. um, I was making yeah. films and I realized actually I could also build a business around this. Um, so my first business was actually a TV production company. did that for about seven or eight years. Um, then started investing and advising a lot of other intellectual property based businesses. And one thing led to another, I ended up moving to Singapore here and setting up, um, co-founding the, um, the first startup accelerator in Southeast Asia, um, which we did 10 years ago now um, in Singapore. So. Why that transition? Um, I think I realized um, I'm fascinated by technology, mm -hmm. um, but um, you have to be very diligent to be a scientist or an engineer. And in all honesty, my core skill, again, something you realize as you grow up and you know yourself better, and I've realized my, my core skill is storytelling. Mm -hmm. I'm good at helping people make sense of where they come from and where they're going to. Mm -hmm. I used to do that in film, and now I do it with entrepreneurs. Um, I help them tell a story about their own future and how they're going to be successful, yeah. um, and then we try and make it come true. Yeah. So in a sense, it's, um, it's the same skill I've always been using throughout life, um, just a different kind of script. Yeah. Instead of a film script, it's a, a business plan. or. A, yeah. I think one of the reasons why I focused on health recently is that um, apart from it being, it seems to be a meaningful thing, Absolutely. it's also intellectually I think the most challenging area of all to innovate in. You've got life and death, you've got egos, you've got huge amounts of money, um, you've got regulation. There are all kinds of constraints and stakeholders involved in healthcare and I think often when well-intentioned pure technologies companies come into that space, yeah. They make an assumption that this is all about efficiency. These people are so disorganised, you know. But that's true for a two-year-old's birthday party as well. You're going to do exactly. it. It's, it's disorganised. Yeah. The reality is maybe but more disorganised than, than what you would like to be. Yeah. And having you know, and I, I took a job as an interim CEO for a cancer clinic, and um, I that was fascinating because you see how the decisions that patients actually choose to make about a life and death situation are not purely clinical decisions, they're much more subtle than that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's true across healthcare. Yeah. Accelerators, venture builders, they are uh, popping up like mushrooms, they're all over the place. Uh, you might even argue that the, the space is overcrowded. Um, so I I'm curious to, for you to reflect a bit on that experience. Why did you start it at the time? Where did the idea come from? Where did you what was the inspiration for that? What did you learn? Can you shed a bit of light on that? If I'm brutally honest, we were just the right guys in the right place at the right time. Okay. I think a lot of people could have done what we did. Mm -hmm. um, when I say we, my co-founder is Wong Meng Wang, um, who's a um, local Singaporean, but he built two venture-backed businesses in the US. He returned to Singapore for family reasons in 2009, um, and we met up and we both realized that Singapore had two out of the three critical things to build a startup ecosystem. It had lots of money, you know, this is the centre for wealth management around yeah. the region. It had lots of talent, smart people, and a desire for smart people to come and live here. But it was missing social capital. So it had economic capital and intellectual capital, but not social capital. So with a bunch of much younger local guys, we, we set up the island's first co-working space. So during the day, it was a kind of a co-working space, very small. And in the evening, it was a kind of geek hangout where people would, you know, try and make their own DNA sequencing machines. Okay. And, do their own brain implants and uh, you know, the random stuff, um, and that was so successful that within um, you know within a month we had we were kicking people out at two o'clock in the morning. This is back in two thousand nine. It was really the party the whole time. He, um, after he left, and he said, "Look, I've got a young family. I don't want to do this. Um, why don't you guys do it? You seem to be good at building community." And the advice they gave us was that so so it wasn't a formal uh, joint venture or anything with Techstars, but they were very generous in sharing their know-how. 
Um, and I think like most sort of formulas, when you bring something from another place, 60-70% um, of it works out of the box and the rest you have to reinvent. Yeah. And that was absolutely our experience. Um, the, what we were lacking in Asia was tacit knowledge. If you um, grow up in a place like Silicon Valley, you can just walk into a cafe and say, hey, I have a term sheet from an investor, can mm -hmm. someone give me advice? You know, and that's perfectly okay. Yeah. That kind of community didn't exist. And, and things that we now take for granted, like uh, Lean Startup, I mean, the book didn't come out until 2012, yeah. and we set up in 2010. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, and we were doing much of the same kind of thing, but it wasn't formalized. So tacit knowledge wasn't there. Investors in Asia, I'm talking about wealthy individuals, have been used to investing in things like cafes, where you know you have, there's an upfront cost, sixty, seventy thousand dollars to set up a cafe or a small restaurant, and then you know within a couple of months is the thing working or not. Exactly. And Predictable cash flow. Right? Cash flow. Yeah. Whereas if you're going to invest in a tech startup, then you're going to have to wait for you know, five years, and then it might become a success or not. So there was a whole that, that's a whole different kettle of fish. So a thing that's different now is I think people are very aware that there are that um, deep tech startups can be a very different kind of asset class. There are metrics that you can apply. Um, it isn't a complete mystery. It's not random, but it's not predictable either. Yeah, exactly. If you would have to maybe critique a bit where we are today, right? Where do you feel are the, the flaws, maybe, or the gaps? So I think some of the challenges are of Singapore's startup ecosystem is that you know, we, we have this national characteristic, Kiasu, uh, Hokkien word that means fear of losing out, which um, it's not quite uniquely Singapore, there are other parts of Southeast Asia that have it too, but it isn't something that's universal. For example, Taiwan doesn't have QSU. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is that there is a, sometimes I feel a, will, a lack of willingness to share information openly and a lack of willingness to understand that paying it forward can return huge dividends to you. Um, so there is no, there hasn't been you know, historically a tradition of mentoring, for example, in, in Asia. And that's now being fixed. There's a wonderful organization called the, the Asian Institute for Mentoring that Chow Yan Lu has set up. Um, and that's creating a new generation of mentors who understand that if you share what you know, value will come back to you. Mm -hmm. But it isn't a transaction. Yeah. So moving away from a kind of transactional, I give you this, you give me that mindset towards a mindset that says it could be exponential, what we create together. Um, that's something, um, no criticism of Asia, it, it, that matter you isn't everywhere at all. But I think that's a, a key thing for the future. Yeah. Why should it be the same? Yeah. Um, maybe what we need to find here in Singapore and in Southeast Asia is you know, our version of, of what success looks like, and that will have different cultural drivers. I think some of those are demographic, for example. You know, I, when I'm explaining Asia to foreigners, I always say there's old rich Asia, places like Singapore and Japan. And then there's young emerging Asia like Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, with tens of millions of people who are all coming into the middle class. And that means there's a different shape to the kind of innovations we need and a different shape to the opportunities out there. So it is unlikely that we're you know, going to have a sort of techno-libertarian driven mm -hmm. valley style yeah. you know, success story here. I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Totally understand. Are there specific interesting things you're seeing happening there? So interesting innovations, interesting companies, interesting new yes. products? Let me give you a couple of examples. So at the, at the bottom of that, there's a company which I mentored, where JFDI didn't invest in them, but we mentored a wonderful business called um, Cushy Baby in uh, India. They work with um, traditional tribal communities who are largely illiterate. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem for health workers there is you go into a village and there's a bunch of kids running around. Um, have they been vaccinated or, vaccinated or not? Don't know. Yeah. Cushy Baby spotted the fact that in many of these communities there is a tradition of giving kids a pendant when they're born, which goes around their neck. Yeah. So they've stuck an RFID tag in the back of that, and that means with a cheap mobile phone, a health worker can scan the RFID tag and you know exactly which kid you're talking about. Oh, that's ingenious. <laughs> really good. So, and then that, so that then builds into electronic health records um, done on mobile devices in a very affordable way. It's fantastic with business, and that's already supporting millions of kids in, in, in um, some of the underprivileged areas of, uh, of India. We have also an audience specifically for the Stable Innovation Series who are younger, maybe aspiring to get into entrepreneurship, hopefully aspiring to get into entrepreneurship with sustainability angles. Um, what would be your message towards them? Um, I know it's a big question, but take it any way you want to take it. What would you tell them? I would start with one, I would leave one message really, which is build a business, make profit, 
but then call it surplus if you're very impact oriented and channel the surplus back into making impact. Don't start out with a, a non-profit mindset. The temptation if you're driven by impact, which is a very good, noble instinct to have, the temptation is to say, let's create a non-profit. And what you do if you do that is you have a business model which basically involves holding your hand out and begging for money from the government, from rich people, from the public. And every time you do that, you're taking money away from charitable causes which can't build a sustainable business. Now, making impact is not easy. Building sustainable, commercially sustainable impact is extremely hard. So my suggestion would be always start for profit businesses, but if you're ashamed of the word profit, call it surplus, mm -hmm. but make a profit. And secondly, don't necessarily imagine that, as with every entrepreneur, don't imagine the very first thing you start in life is going to be the thing that is your legacy in history. You know, most of us, myself included, you, you, you have to fall off the bicycle two or three times yeah. before you know how to ride a bike. Yeah. Um, give yourself some space. Understand that building a business that's understanding how to manage people, how to raise money, how to make anything happen is actually quite hard, despite all of the kind of mythology around startups. So don't be afraid if the very first business you do doesn't work, and don't be afraid if it's not for impact. Um, try and run a business, organize something first, and try and make a profit, and then do something good with the profit. Thank you. I think those are great, great, great uh, last words. So thanks a lot for participation, and uh, for the audience, hope you enjoy. You're welcome.